Hello and welcome to another edition of Mailbag. What is Mailbag? Well, Mailbag is a feature of the channel where you guys leave lots of comments on the channel and I attempt to answer those comments or if I can't answer those comments, I throw it out to you guys who have more knowledge on some of this stuff than I do. So, let's get into the first Mailbag of this session. Remember, like, comment, subscribe to the channel. Go over to Instagram and follow me there. Go over to Facebook, follow me there. That's where the normal notices are. And consider becoming a Patreon. I'm gonna be honest and say, you may see this as a part two, okay? Uh, or you may see this as a continuation because the first piece I looked at the clock as I hit the um, as I came to the end of my response and it was up at 11 minutes and I tried to keep my bags around about eight to nine minutes um, so uh, as I say this may be part two so if you see it as part two you'll know why anyway this was uh, a response to the Oberheim uh, apology and Anderson's gets the UVX8 and an SMR I did in May 2022. After I'd actually made the response on the channel, then uh, other responses hit the channel as well. And the first one comes from the Seabone 1979, who is a re fairly regular commentator on the channel, so to be fair. He writes, Ha 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 ha! Come on now, at Truman. We know that there isn't that much money in the music industry. This isn't the 1980s and there are scant amounts of major labels left and anyone making anything has to push thousands and thousands into streams to even break even. People aren't spending dollars and dollars and dollars and dollars and dollars on profit tens and the Obiam X8 makes tons of money from their tracks. They are doing it on ITB with sample libraries and other software. To assume that it's Oberheim consummate with professionals making Beauchamp is foolery. The people that are going to buy Oberheims today and keep the company afloat are absolutely the weekend warriors. Furthermore, the JP80 was the vision and brainchild of the original founder uh, of Roland and the original JP8 that we all know and love and he originally intended the JP-8 to be the JP-80 uh, but couldn't due to the technology limitations in 1981 when the JP-8 was released. The Jupiter-80 stands up to just about anything, work hard enough and those 256 voices and you can make just about anything in your imagination. Honestly, the OBX-8 seems to be a one-trick pony. Yes, it will do with Van Hagelin sounds beautifully all day uh, for the money, but it seems quite limited and doesn't actually look that good. And lastly, the Beringer version is going to eat Oberheim's lunch. Yes, it is coming. It's in the flesh at Anderson's for you to review. So I, you just can't think it's a vaporware. We can see it coming from a mile away. But it is great to hear another view on this subject. Um, the people I tend to talk to and correspond with uh, through the channel are all conferring the, this view that I've put and that the Seabone has put together. There is a view that a limited production one would probably sell out. And if this were the case, R&D costs to create the OBX8 would have to be absorbed by much fewer units and therefore the cost has to be hiked to account for that. But as I've said before, I still believe this is a massive premium. I think if they sold it at a less amount of money, yes, they would have to sell more units to recover costs, but I think they probably would have sold or will sell more units. Just to follow up on the at Anderson's uh, Sense and Key Tech comment, this is a review posted on their YouTube channel fairly recently to the point where this reply was written. The OBXA hasn't arrived as as sorry the UBXA hasn't arrived as of January 2023. 
but I don't think it's far off. I really don't. Um, then Truman comes back in. At this point, I sort of kind of think I took a bit of a back seat, but let's see. Um, he writes to Sebo 1979. The argument starts. LOL. Well, again, with respect, I disagree with pretty much all of this. Yes, the music business, the vast majority of folks are believing they are engaged in and uh, the one you mentioned where artists producers are barely breaking even is not a really a lucrative endeavor most of these folks can't afford either a profit 10 or an obx8 the music business i'm talking about and have been part of for three decades is extremely lucrative and the obx8 is just another tool as evidenced by who is actually pre-ordering and buying uh, and posting about their excitement about it. They ain't weekend warriors and EP folks. They are the folks who have real studio rooms and are working for clients. The idea of the OBX8 or really any other vintage OB line seems to be a one trick pony and only does very inhaling sounds suggest you may have never actually used one of these synths in production before. Nostalgia hasn't driven the price of the vintage OB line to where it is. The fact that no modern uh, iteration, hardware or software, is really a great replacement for the real thing. Believe me, I tried very hard a few years ago not to buy an original LM1. But in the end, there's just no equivalent. And yes, there is a place for Berengas in this world to produce their approximate to the OB synths. And I would certainly agree they will sell hard hardily. But I suspect the OBX8 will sell as many as they can produce with some leftover for over demand. It's a very different synth that ha will sell to a different market se segment and that will be grateful to play 5,400 US with tax, including myself. Eating Oberheim's lunch is not really irrelevant or astute. It's soccer and badminton. They are not competing in the same customers. John, your comment about a massive pre premium is misguided. The premium is not based on comparisons to the Jupiter 80 or even the UBXA. Trying to think about the premium just opposes to cost of the three OB line vintage since the OBX8 is essentially is. That's the premium I'm very, very pleased to pay. But as with all things, to their own. Now, as I said to Truman at the time, I think many people will have different, including you and I, different views, that is. Well, cost is a factor, and the cost is always a factor. Functionality is also a major factor. And I still feel the premium on this synth does not justify the function. But as I said, from my view, and not your view, from where you're looking at it from a different perspective to the way I'm looking at this, my non-music job, I have to evaluate, or in my non-music job, should I say, I have to evaluate the features and functions of different systems that have been put forward to solve the problems that I am presented with. Those decisions can cost my employer millions of pounds. So I am using the, just, I'm using the same justifying mindset, if you like, um, as I would for a solution for a problem at work and having to tell my client that they have to spend a lot of money to solve it. I understand that I am not necessarily comparing apples with apples and I've said that all along. A Roland synth is definitely not an Oberheim synth and I kind of leave it at that. 